Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here and uh, always happy to be introduced by, by a Maritimer, uh, particularly from Dalhousie. I think University of Saskatchewan's first faculty were brought out from Dalhousie, so it's almost a, uh, uh, an offspring of the university in many ways. Um, I, I want to talk to you about water in Western Canada, and I'm going to focus most specifically on the mountains rather than the prairie area, simply because uh, the feeds to our major rivers are largely mountain-derived. Uh, and I'll be talking about the climate system and how it's changing as well. And then I'm going to make a uh, major announcement. That's the what we will do part of this talk, um, which uh, uh, wasn't planned when we initially, um, uh, when I started putting together an abstract for this, but uh, it's news that came this month, which is good news. So uh, happy to talk about that. Um, I'll give you a little background to global water security in the global sense, and uh, then uh, we'll zoom in and, um, you know, there's, most of humanity lives in an arid zone of some sort. Uh, estimates are about 85 percent. And the, uh, uh, the estimates are in just a few years, 2030, uh, over half of humanity will live in uh, areas of very, very high water stress. Um, we already have terrible problems occurring with respect to water around the world. Six to eight million people are killed each year from water-related disasters and diseases. So waterborne diseases, which I won't get into very much, but remember they're terrible, and then floods, and droughts, uh, other things. There are uh, three quarters of a billion people who lack access to safe drinking water, and two and a half billion people lack access to adequate san sanitation. And the follow-on effects of this are horrific, uh, from the inability of children to attend school, and so raise their communities out of this, uh, the impacts are often most severe on women who in many cultures are tasked with uh, providing, bringing water into the communities and, uh, and without proper san sanitation as, as children uh, often drop out of school later on in life. So um, there are great problems there. So this is the global context to it. If we, uh, if we look at water security challenges that we face, um, you can really break them down into three in a sense, and one is degradation of, ag of water quality, um, particularly from agricultural runoff, uh, industry and sewage. Uh, this is a, a massive problem, and there's often greater competition for that water, uh, particularly when it crosses boundaries. Another is the risk from extreme events, and anyone living in Calgary and area knows, knows what I mean when I'm talking about an extreme event. You think of the flood of 2013 but also think of the drought of 2015 uh, when we had exceptionally low, low water supplies on the Bull River or extreme events such as the fires in Fort McMurray and elsewhere in the last few years, which have been uh, um, remarkably high. And this puts pressure on communities on, on agriculture, uh, both from the damage associated with these things, but then also floods and droughts are often coupled together and droughts often end in a flood. And uh, 2013, Interestingly, if it hadn't been for three days of exceptionally heavy rain, it would have been an exceptional drought year because the rest of the year was really dry. So uh, uh, floods and droughts do hang out together. And then uh, environmental change. Uh, uh, climate change is amplified in the polar regions, but it's also amplified in the high mountains uh, in the colder parts of the world. And uh, we see the impacts of this in melting glaciers, uh, thawing permafrost, uh, declining snowpacks and changing stream flow. So I'm going to focus in, I'm going to zero in now a little bit more onto the mountains. And the, uh, the mountains have uh, uh, major roles uh, for us. They provide services. 24% um, of the Earth's land surface and over a billion people live in and adjacent to mountains around the world. So simply as a home, uh, they're very important. But they supply water for over half of humanity. And, um, and an example, when we zoom into the prairies, the, uh, the major water supplies for all of Alberta's cities and Saskatchewan cities, Saskatoon, Regina, um, Prince Albert, Swift Current, are derived from the rivers which come out of the Rocky Mountains. And in a city like Saskatoon, uh, where the University of Saskatchewan is, 99% of the water in the South Saskatchewan River coming through Saskatoon comes from Alberta. And of that, about 80% of that is coming from the mountains and foothills. 
So even when you're way out in the eastern prairies, you've got to, if you're smart, you keep an eye to the western skies, out to the mountains, and see what's going on there. The uh, mountains also provide very important ecosystem services, uh, regulating climate, air quality, and stream flow. The, uh, and uh, those who live in the area, and if you haven't, take a visit out there to visit the mountain parks, um, the uh, uh, cultural services that mountains provide, spiritual and recreational, is ex extremely important. However, mountains, there's a dichotomy to water security in mountains. Water from mountains both sustains us and is also provides a, uh, is a source of a tremendous risk that we have to live with. And so you can have a community such as High River, uh, where the uh, region relies on mountain water supplies. It's a very dry part of Alberta. And the irrigation from that allows lush vegetation, uh, crops, uh, gardens, hay pastures, but also a, a regular series of flooding events over the years, which in 2013 destroyed many parts of High River, resulting in loss of life. That's this two-face uh, to water that we have to deal with. And uh, if we look at uh, uh, recent floods around the world, uh, in Western Canada, we have very expensive damages, maybe $6 billion of damage in the 2013 floods uh, in Alberta, but uh, relatively small loss of life. In the less developed world, the damages are smaller, but the loss of life is much higher. And uh, flood damages in Canada have been increasing dramatically um, from Confederation to about the year 2000. Flood damages in 2010 dollars in Canada were roughly $1 billion over the whole history of the country up to that point. Since then, they've been running at more than $1 billion a year and, uh, and a dramatic increase. And that resulted in an inquiry uh, to the uh, Parliamentary Budget Office uh, quite recently over what's happening. And where are those flood damages occurring? They're occurring in Western Canada, in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. We're the epicenter of flood damages in this country right now. And then when you add other natural disasters, such as fires and windstorms and hailstorms, uh, the insurance industry just shakes their head uh, at the uh, cost of doing business in, in Alberta in particular. The, um, uh, so there's, there's, a, uh, there's a, a danger there, but there are also tremendous services. The colored areas of this map are parts of the world that receive water services from mountains outside it. And the, I'm sorry, it's a little bit hard to see, but the bluer areas are the most important water services. But we see large area of Western Canada receives an important water service. And further south in the United States, uh, extremely important water services for the American West. So that's an uh, important thing to keep in mind. Remember, over half the world's population is drinking water out of the mountains and living off mountain water, even if they don't live in those mountains. And then this is the other side. I mentioned the, uh, the tough side of, of water, um, uh, whether it's uh, floods, uh, such as you see a photograph of the Canmore flood, the Fort McMurray fires, uh, drought on the prairies. Um, these are associated with mountains or regions with mountains in them in terms of the meteorology. And we're dealing with climate change. This is not a stationary system. It's not just humans who are changing and growing in population and growing in our demands. But the climate is changing, and that's changing the ability of the hydrological cycle to service humanity's demands and to sustain natural ecosystems. So the, uh, we have changing precipitation, uh, uh, reduced snowfall, um, more rapidly melting snow, retreating glaciers because ice melt is faster in many areas. Um, the, uh, there's very high confidence that the retreat of glaciers around the world in the mountains is due to anthropogenic climate change. And uh, we have uh, dramatic permafrost uh, decline occurring in the north, causing collapse of roads, movement of settlements, even loss of coastal settlements in Alaska, and coming loss in Canada over time. When we look at the uh, satellite uh, observations of snow-covered area in the northern hemisphere, let's see if I can get this thing to work. Okay, so there we are in Western Canada. This color is indicating that we're losing uh, one to two days of snow cover per year from 1970 to 2004. That's uh, one to two months of snow cover in that time. And the, uh, it's, uh, this is spring snow cover loss in the area. And it's measured by Landsat, so the, it's a repeat 
uh, satellite measurement with a fairly high level of confidence with that. So the, uh, and the advantage of a measurement like this is that we don't have weather stations up on high mountains that have been around for 35 years. We don't have good ways of measuring the change in temperatures in these remote places. But satellites can pick up that snow cover in the high mountains and give us direct evidence of that change. We have more information though. Uh, the glaciers are themselves giant thermometers and giant indicators of changes in our climate because they're, they're elephants. They have long memories of the climate system. And so the, uh, by mass balance measurements, which are sort of like a, a money budget that we run on glaciers through glacier services around the world, and Canada has a national glacier service within the Department of Natural Resources, uh, we know about the loss of glaciers, the ablation of them around the world. And uh, this is showing the, uh, the rates. Um, and the, um, there are about 200,000 glaciers and the, uh, uh, the mass budgets are shrinking all around the world at various rates. Some of the greatest rates are in the uh, Himalaya and in parts of uh, Greenland, uh, northern Canada, but you see in the uh, western Canada in the mountains we have uh, tremendous declines. And in fact, the record high uh, ice loss rates out of the Pato and Athabasca Glacier are last year and the year before, uh, the all-time record. So we, uh, we've had exceptional uh, exceptional impacts on our glaciers. And this change in snow cover in glaciers is important because the mountain west through North America is the main provider of stream flow. Overall, it's about 90% of the stream flow from a line that roughly west of the Mississippi going up uh, north from there. So that's the tremendous interest. So I'm going to zoom in to uh, the Canadian Rockies, and uh, which are the source of the Saskatchewan and the Athabasca river basins on this side of the Rockies. Of course, on the west side, the Columbia and the Fraser also emanate from them. And if we go a little bit further south, we have the Missouri River in the United States. So you can argue that the uh, Canadian Rockies and the area around them are the hydrological apex of North America, and that what matters, what happens here matters quite a lot. I'm going to show you a, uh, a scientific graph slide you're going to hate, um, and uh, but we'll spend some time with it. And, Maybe you won't hate it quite so much when I'm done. Uh, this is the Bow River at Banff, and it has the longest stream measurement record in Canada, going back to 1912. Uh, the, the gauge there has been well tended. The area upstream has been a national park over that whole time. So we know a lot about the basin of the Bow River at Banff. We know a lot about the gauge, and we trust the measurements as much as we trust any stream flow measurement. Uh, realize they're often done under difficult conditions. And if we look at that over time, uh, this, this chart here, uh, whenever you see a red point, that's a really high stream flow. And this is spring on this side. This is fall over here. Here's mid midsummer. So when you see red, you're seeing floods, basically, uh, going back to 1920. And then a uh, period of not very many floods uh, through this period of time. And then uh, we're getting up to a uh, recent time when we had a major flood in 2013. And you say, wow, that's, uh, can we see any trends or changes in that stream flow? Well, there's not really a trend for de decreasing stream flow for the Bow River at Banff. So that's very good news for Calgary and very good news for the irrigation districts. But the timing is changing. And what I have up here is the hydrograph. This is the average flow. This is the highest ever recorded flow. This is the lowest ever recorded flow. And where it's blue, this is where the flow has been going up. These are five-day periods where there's a trend for them to increase. Where it's red, it's where it's decreasing. And you see the increase is in March and April, and the decrease is in July and August and September. And both of those are statistically significant, and it works out to about 25% less water flow in August now than there was in the early 20th century coming through. So that's not good news, uh, because we built our infrastructure for storing water. Uh, we made decisions about how, many, how much uh, land we irrigate, we decided on the water licenses 100 years ago based on how it was then. And uh, we don't have that now. The shift in timing is to earlier flows. And, uh, and this will continue and continue to create problems for managing water in southern Alberta, this seasonal shift. Um, the interesting thing is that as, uh, that peak hasn't shifted yet, but we anticipate it will shift over the next uh, 100 years. 
And so if the stream flow, which currently feeds irrigation in southern Alberta, is coming a month earlier than it does now, how will we store that water for the uh, irrigators with the current crops they have? Now, maybe the growing season will shift. Maybe the crops, crop types will change so that water can be used when it's available. But right now, we don't store very much, and we don't manage it very much. Uh, we simply, it comes out of the Rockies in June, and we irrigate in June, and everybody's happy. And we're losing that system because we're losing some of the snow and ice in the mountains. If we go further north to the Athabasca River near Jasper, we see a very similar thing. The uh, decline in the summer flows, some increase in the early midwinter flows uh, going on in there. So uh, this, uh, the Bow River is not alone, it's a general trend across the Rockies. And some of the rivers further south in the Old Man are declining in their annual flows as well. So you say, why is a professor from Saskatchewan talking about these things? Why is he even interested? Well, it's because uh, we drink your water. So um, uh, when water leaves Calgary, it goes to Saskatoon. And uh, there we are, and then we drink it. And uh, you can make very good beer and sell it back to you and things like that. So the, um, yeah, anyway, the, that Saskatchewan River is the lifeblood across the prairies. And the, uh, it flows east across Alberta through the irrigation districts, feeds Medicine Hat, goes into Lake Diefenbaker in Saskatchewan, feeds another irrigation district, carries on to Manitoba, where it eventually enters Lake Winnipeg, and, uh, and its chemical load then contributes to the nutrient problems in Lake Winnipeg, then carries on as the Nelson River, where Manitoba Hydro generates hydroelectricity from it. So many, many uses, and it ends up in Hudson Bay. Um, so there it is. There's the, uh, some of the Bow River water. This is flowing out of Lake Diefenbaker in Saskatchewan, um, and uh, then it ends up supporting prairie agriculture and moving on. So, the, so we, we like having Alberta next to us in Saskatchewan. The only problem is that you use water too. And, um, and so the consumption of water in Alberta has been increasing over time. You see it's fairly low in the 70s and before then. And now in dry years, it approaches 45%. Um, so fortunately, there's, a, there's an agreement between the Prairie Provinces uh, the Prairie Provinces Water Apportionment Agreement, uh, which uh, has some complexities, but in the simple version, 50% uh, of the flows that arise in Alberta are guaranteed to be passed on to Saskatchewan. And um, in normal years, that's not a problem for Alberta to reach. This is the, uh, the entitlement. The blue line is the limit of that agreement. And you can see a few dry years, uh, Alberta came very close to reaching the limits of that agreement, but has always met the agreement, and that was great. And a wet year is not a problem at all. The, um, so as long as we don't have droughts in the future, we should be fine. But to keep meeting that agreement, Alberta put a moratorium on expansion of water licenses in the uh, uh, Bow and parts of the South Saskatchewan River Basin. It was roughly 10 years ago now. And um, uh, to uh, uh, stop the increase in use. And when towns uh, such as Okotoks uh, want to increase their water use as they grow, uh, those water licenses aren't necessarily available. When we look at the flow of the Sask uh, South Saskatchewan River leaving Alberta, there are trends in that. The, uh, the blue points here are the natural flows. These are the flows that would occur if uh, uh, European settlement of Alberta had never occurred, if there was no Calgary, no irrigation, and all the rest. And you see there's a, a decline there, and that's due to a climate change, loss of snow and glaciers in the mountains over time. And that uh, we're has dropped about 12% of the flow over 90 years. But the, the red points are the actual flows leaving Alberta in the Saskatchewan River system. And, um, and those are down 40% over time. So that's a big change when you're downstream in Saskatchewan. And uh, Saskatchewan wants to grow its economy and all these things now. And that upstream consumption has increased. So now we're looking at a regime that delivers this. Early 20th century is delivering that. So it's, it's a big difference. Now let's add more climate change to that. Because that data was up to about 2004. 2015, it was an incredible year in Western Canada. This is the weather anomaly in the spring. The anomaly mean, meaning simply how much higher than average was the air temperature in that time. And those uh, dark reds are five to six degrees up in northwestern Canada. But you see even down in, uh, down in here, we're looking at two to three degrees 
of temperature normally. It was an incredible spring and snow melted uh, in some cases six weeks early and the glaciers started melting very, very early and led to a, a record glacier melt. And um, interestingly, precipitation wasn't that much lower that year, but we had a drought anyway. This is the flow of the Bow River near its mouth, so in eastern Alberta after it's passed through the irrigation districts. And uh, these are the upper and lower percentiles. Uh, so 75% of observations are lower than that line, and 25% are lower than this line. And uh, the median would be right in here. And what you're seeing is uh, some early high flows in early April, and after that, things stayed below normal. And at one point in July, it was down to uh, less than 20 cubic meters per second when we, we would be expecting over 100 cubic meters per second in the river. So we had a hydrological drought brought on by warmth, by exceptional warmth, and that was not an El Nino year, 2015. There was something called the blob out in the Pacific, which messed up a blob of warm air, which messed up some of the weather patterns. But a lot of this, uh, through forensic evidence, uh, forensic analysis done by Environment Canada, the scientists are now suggesting a lot of that warmth was a manifestation of climate change, and it gives us a look at what the future might hold for us, and that's a bit scary. So why is that happening? We have some data from the region to say something about what, why things have shifted. One is Marmot Creek Research Basin. It was established in 1962 in the Kananaskis Valley by the Canadian government as a mountain research area to study the impact of forests and uh, weather on stream flow generation and was maintained for many years and we restarted it a few years ago. Unfortunately, it was closed in the 80s. Um, you might recognize Nikiska uh, Ski Hill over here next to it, which came later. But Marmot Creek was there before Nikiska. And uh, so the continuity of high mountain measurements is really rare in Canada. It just doesn't exist anywhere else. And, uh, and so it, it tells us a lot about what's uh, going on in the mountain of hydrology and weather and climate in that area. And one thing that they measure in Marmot Creek uh, is uh, snowpack using snow surveys. They measure the depth and density of the snow. And when we compare those over time, this is up in the alpine zone at high elevation. This is millimeters of snow water equivalent. This would be the depth of water if all that snow was turned into liquid miraculously or after it melts. And uh, you see the gap there. That gap is when the federal government closed it and then when we reopened it. So that's a funding gap. Other gap and uh, Canada's our data records are full of this in Canada. You try to look at the stream flow records in the 1930s; they all have a gap, and, uh, and we haven't had precipitation measurements that are reliable since 2007 in much of Canada uh, because of uh, funding issues for the collection agencies. So anyway, the uh, so there's a gap, but there's no trend in the Alpine. It's just about as much snow now as there was then, but down in the forest zone. This is where the cross-country ski trails were put in in the 1960s. Those of you who ski around Ribbon Creek at the bottom and all that, we have less than half of the snow pack on the ground there now that we had in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And it was declining through that period. And so that's a, uh, that's a massive change, and it changes the availability and timing of water coming out of the uh, mountains. The other big indicators are the glaciers. I showed you some of the glacier retreats around the world. It's good to look at one closer to home, the Pato Glacier. You could see from Pato Lookout at Bow Summit um, a long time ago. Well, not that long, but uh, within some people's lifetime, and you can't now. And this is where it was in 1952, and uh, 2014, it's actually back up here now. And uh, areas where we had experiments in 2008 are now a lake that we're calling Lake Monroe over the scientists who used to conduct experiments on the ice before it was a lake. Um, so anyway, there's dramatic changes at the Pato Glacier, and if you go to the Athabasca Glacier in the Columbia Ice Fields, you can uh, drive or walk through the limits of the previous glaciation and, and see what uh, a visual indicator of climate change over maybe not just your lifetime, but your parents' or grandparents' lifetime. So that's indicators of the types of changes we have occurring here. So I guess the message is that both locally and globally, the water environment we have is under pressure. Um, the prairie drought of 1999 to 2004 
was the worst since agricultural settlement began in the late 1800s. The floods in 2016 were the most expensive, if not the highest water over that time. There were high, larger floods uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, but the floods in Manitoba and Saskatchewan in 2014 were unprecedented because they occurred through summer rainfall and not spring snowmelt. And that's never happened in the history of any measurements, even when you go back to the Hudson Bay Company records and to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the stories uh, told through our First Nations, uh, Indigenous peoples, we never talk about heavy rains in July causing flooding over vast areas. Sometimes a, a storm that wipes out your canola crop on one field, but not over half a province and into another province. But that's what happened in 2014. Toronto in 2013, on and on. And water quality problems, algal blooms. Our, uh, our prairie water was fairly pristine within my lifetime. And uh, of course, Lake Winnipeg is now as bad as Lake Erie in many ways and, and dying due to toxic algal blooms. Lake Erie in southern Ontario had an algal bloom in so bad a few years ago that Toledo, Ohio had to cease its water intakes. So you had a city of 450,000 people uh, without a water supply. The uh, Lake Diefenbaker that I showed before is developing green algal blooms in certain years. And Regina and Moose Jaw had to reduce their water consumption last year because of uh, algal blooms in um, Buffalo Pound Lake that were producing uh, water that couldn't be treated. So we've got terrible problems. We have impacts from mines, and we will have impacts from the legacy of, of oil sands in the future. And uh, the global impacts are, are massive. Floods in Thailand in 2011 caused $46 billion of damage to the world's economy because they couldn't manufacture chips. So floods elsewhere affect us here as well. A lot of this is driven by climate change and Canada has the dubious distinction of being at the forefront of the impacts of climate change because we are a cold country and we thaw first. So uh, because our hydrology, our water supply, our water quality and our way of life is built around having reliable winters that store water as snow and ice and then release it in the summer when we want it, as we start to lose that as warming occurs, we're going to see profound changes and we are seeing profound changes to, from a longer flood season to less reliable water supplies, to, uh, uh, to droughts that have been unexpected. And uh, the uh, extreme events are coupled to this because of the greater warmth and water vapor in the atmospheric system, and we're certainly seeing the impacts of that in summer rain floods in the prairies and, and others. And this has been recognized around the world from Barack Obama, uh, identifying this as the greatest threat to the planet, uh, to Mark Carney, a good Canadian, Western Canadian out in the UK saying one of the biggest threat to the world economy is in fact climate change. So how do we do this? How do we adapt to change and mitigate threats from water? Well, we can't do it with the science basis we have now. Our science is not adequate to this task. We've had too few scientists. We've been operating under fairly restricted funding regimes for decades now not just Canada, but around the world, but very much in Canada. So we need new science so we can better understand changing our systems. We need new modeling tools so we can better uh, capture the forces and predict the events, uh, the extreme events and the Im implications on society, whether it's a flood coming in 10 days or a, uh, a general desiccation of a region coming in 50 years. We need to know so we can plan. And we need monitoring systems. We need to better measure um, our water and our climate, our snowpacks, our soil moisture, so that we can warn of critical environmental changes. We need early warning systems. And we need mechanisms to transfer that knowledge to society. It uh, can't all go to governments. It needs to go to people so that they can take action as communities, as individuals, as cultures. So there's a grand challenge in all this. And the grand challenge is how can we best prepare for and manage water futures in the face of dramatically increasing risks. So I get to make a lovely announcement here. Uh, we had this challenge and we wrote a proposal and the government funded it. And so the, uh, it doesn't happen that often, that easily. It's, uh, 
an incredible thing. So uh, the Canada First Research Excellence Fund uh, announced earlier this month that it funded the Global Water Futures Program, uh, which is headed by the University of Saskatchewan, but includes 18 universities around the country, 145 international institutions uh, going more, and they funded it to the tune of $78 million over seven years, which is unprecedented. <laughs> it's, uh, Oh, thank you. It was not only the largest research grant ever received by the University of Saskatchewan, but it's the largest research grant for water research to a group of universities in the world. And so we're, we're honoured to have that. We're also terrified because uh, we've got seven years to solve a lot of problems and uh, we, we've got to do that. So what do, we, what do we aim to do with this thing? The um, one is place Canada as a global leader and I almost say back as a global leader. Our reputation as a water science country in the 70s and 80s was unexcelled, and uh, we were seen as, as uh, the best of the best. We want to be back there, and uh, certainly we want to have that for regions where snow, ice, and frozen ground impact water supply, so that other countries around the world are looking to us for solutions. We also want to address the needs of the Canadian economy so they can adapt and manage uh, the risks of uncertain future water and extreme events. So the objectives of the program, the three objectives, one is improving disaster warning. We want to work with uh, provincial, federal governments and other interested groups to uh, improve monitoring, modeling technologies, uh, improve the scientific knowledge and develop a national water forecasting capacity, which Canada doesn't have. We stand out as the only country in the G7 that doesn't have that, um, so that we can predict the risk and severity of extreme events. And uh, very much inspired by uh, the events in Calgary in 2013. And one always wonders, what if we had, what if we knew that was coming weeks beforehand? Uh, in Hyde River, Canmore, and Calgary, could we have done, uh, done more to uh, protect people, to protect property, and to reduce the damages? And the answer is yes. Um, but those capabilities, despite excellent service in Alberta that you have from the provincial government, those capabilities aren't there. So we want a really ma massive injection of uh, new technology and science into that uh, so those services improve. We want to predict water futures. We want to be able to say what water will be like in 2080, in 2100, in different parts of the country. When will the streams be flowing? What's their water quality? Will the fish still be able to survive in these streams? Will we still be able to irrigate? How large can cities like Calgary grow? Uh, these are very practical questions. Industries need to know where they can locate and where they really need to look at phasing out. Uh, there may be new opportunities from water as our water systems cha change. We need to know what those are. And then adapting to change and managing risk. Our governance mechanisms uh, were designed for the 20th century for water in Canada and some of our constitutional mechanisms designed in the 19th in the, uh, in the uh, 1800s, in the 19th century. Are they adequate for the future that we have? Is the Prairie Provinces Water Apportionment Agreement still a good tool to manage water when we have both floods and droughts passed between the provinces and when we have massive water quality problems moving from upstream to downstream? These are big questions. Uh, should we grow food in Alberta or generate hydroelectricity in Manitoba? These are broad questions that go beyond a particular province and others that we need to look at as a society that we'll try to deal with. And all this is about risk management, you know, in a sense, right now, I don't know if you can see it, it says zero kilometers to empty, but, um, you know, we, would, we won't want to be in that situation where we're, we're driving on empty and seeing how far we can go. We want to uh, stay ahead of the game. And Canada has had a, a great reputation for doing that in the past, and we want to do it again. So this is uh, sort of global water futures by the numbers. Um, 388 university investigators across the country, including several in Alberta that I'll mention shortly. The uh, 39 industries involved, 45 international research institutes from governments and universities, 11 provincial agencies, 18 universities across Canada, five NGOs. The, um, and big global programs, uh, the United Nations Education, Science, Cultural Organization, UNESCO, the World Climate Research Program, and a new program called Future Earth. We're all directly tied into those and delivering those. So that's how we start to influence things around the world 
as well as fixing our problems at home. In terms of our uh, science, uh, we see basically three science pillars uh, backing up global water futures. Uh, the first is uh, diagnosing and predicting change in cold regions, where we look at the various sciences, from climate science to hydrology, water quality, uh, human water systems, water and health. And, um, and then the second one is big data. How do we measure water better, measure climate, measure its use, measure its quality? Um, how do we uh, take all this data together and analyze it uh, for predictive systems in ways that uh, can make sense and that will allow for risk management? And then the third one is sort of where the rubber hits the road. That's designing the user solutions. Who are the users? You're the users. The communities are. The industries are. The First Nations, agricultural sectors, forestry sectors, mining sectors, others, um, governments. These are all, everyone seems to have an interest in water. And so uh, we'll be starting by consulting widely with the user communities to develop user-led agendas for focusing on specific problems. So what's the sustainability of Edmonton's water supply over the next century? What do prairie cities do when they have an oil spill upstream of them and only one water source? What's the mitigation plan there? Um, what sort of irrigation areas can we uh, think about as being viable in 50 or 100 years? And what sort of crops should they be growing? How can prairie farmers uh, better manage water on their land to increase their productivity? And then how do we sustain our natural ecosystems? Now, these are all types of questions. And uh, there are big ones. It's across Canada, so the, the Great Lakes are a massive issue as well. And Lake Erie is a, a disaster again, uh, which is going to require a, a large effort that we will try to help through the science. But for water shortages, Southern Alberta is the epicenter of that in, in Canada. The science will be transdisciplinary. We are already building hydrological models coupled to water quality models that tie into agricultural land management so we can predict nutrient movements, flooding, droughts, soil moisture conditions, crop growth together in large computer simulation systems. For water measurements, uh, we're going to build upon things like the Cold Regions Hydrological Observatory, which is a set of uh, 35 me weather stations in the high Rockies upstream of Calgary, uh, to new ways of measuring, uh, of measuring water on the ground using new technologies. Our objective is that we will have a revolution in how we observe change in our water supplies uh, by using, uh, we will in fact be designing nano satellites to help us measure waters across Canada, new uh, uh, sensors that we've placed around the country, uh, data collection from areas where we have never taken measurements before. We'll be working with governments to do this and helping them to, uh, to do more of it. And uh, also making that data available directly to the communities, the industries, uh, the governments that are involved. So the idea is that Canada becomes a giant water observatory. And uh, we have a vast, vast nation and parts of it are as undermeasured as the developing world. And we, we want to change that. And uh, we can't do it through putting people out by every station as countries such as China are able to do. We're going to have to do it through enhanced technology. And we hope we can export that technology around the world. And then once we have that data, what are we going to do with it? Well, we're talking about amounts of data that I've never dealt with personally before. So we have a large computer science team helping us with the big data aspects. Uh, we're going to use the cloud uh, for storage and for computing, and then uh, work with social scientists to help us get that data into the form uh, so they can be uh, transmitted to users in, in a, a reasonable way, whether it's an app on your phone or a website or an interactive system on, on your computer screen or through uh, uh, personal discussions uh, with various groups. And then finally, designing the user solutions. What does that mean? Well, we want to provide tools and solutions um, that work in Canada and that we currently uh, lack so we can manage our water environment better in light of uh, unprecedented climate change and growth in our population and economy. Um, we want to make sure that we have these uh, big data, the models, the visualizations, the decision making in an interactive manner that can help people predict and manage risk and help communities make wise decisions based on information. We want to uh, help launch a new era of public 
water disaster warning um, so that in the future floods they may still come but we'll know about them well beforehand and, um, and we can sandbag or evacuate or do whatever we need to do to mitigate the cost of those floods. And if we could provide six months warning of droughts to prairie farmers, they could shift their crops, they could change their patterns of uh, farming uh, to take, uh, so they can ride through the highs and lows of water supply that they'll be facing. The, um, we want a public that's uh, water informed in their decision makings because for the rest of our lives, we will all be personally dealing with a series of water disasters, whether it's quality, floods, or drought. And the more information you have in that, the better you as a person will be able to navigate those difficult waters. So overall, we can say that Global Water Futures will provide Canada with warning of water threats and the tools we need to manage rapidly changing water environments, knowing that the past is no longer a guide to the future for us. And we want to provide global leadership in water environments that are cold, like Canada, this means the high mountain areas around the world, whether it's the Himalayas, the Andes, the Alps, uh, the Hindu Kush, other, other areas uh, in Asia, the Hindu Kush Himalaya and Tibetan Plateau provide water for 1.4 billion people. It's a cold region, so we have a tremendous opportunity there to help that region as well. What about Alberta? Well, there's lots to do in Alberta. As I said, Alberta is a national leader in water disasters, so um, we want you to help help you lose that designation, and um, and the the natural environment and its variability here is working against that. So we're going to engage with the users and stakeholders. Just a few: the Alberta government, of course, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Parks Canada, Agriculture Canada, Natural Resources Canada, the First Nations, the cities: Calgary, Edmonton, EPCOR, Edmonton's Utility the agriculture industries, the irrigation districts, the energy industries, and the watershed associations. We need to engage with them and find out what the issues you're facing right now, and then discuss how we can uh, better provide information solutions that can help you manage your water. We have investigators at the University of Calgary and University of Alberta, um, Professor Masaki Hayashi, Professor Ed Johnson, Professor Sean Marshall at the University of Calgary and um, Professor Flanagan at the University of Alberta, forest fire expert. So we have an Alberta presence there. But we also have um, the Canadian Rockies Hydrological Observatory operating in the headwaters here and a mountain research station called the Coldwater Laboratory, which is currently in Kananaskis, that will be relocating to Canmore. We signed the lease this week and expanding uh, so that we'll have researchers from around the world in Canmore in the upstream part of the Bow River in the headwaters of the South Saskatchewan River Basin, uh, conducting research on the glaciers, the snowpacks, the climate, and the water quality. And uh, that will help tremendously to have that here. The uh, further south, uh, we have uh, West Nose Creek, uh, just outside of Calgary, and Camrose Creek, up by Camrose, which are research areas which help inform the prairie hydrology and management issues in the Saskatchewan River Basin. And uh, the Peace Athabasca Mackenzie Basin is one of intense research uh, from uh, many of the investigators working on oil sands mitigation to further north, uh, looking at the declining permafrost in the Northwest Territories and the impacts of uh, transboundary flows and, and flow regulation on that system. Uh, but of course, we're, country, we're coast to coast. The Columbia River is a big part of this, the Yukon River, the Great Lakes, uh, the St. John River in the east. Uh, other parts of Quebec. And the transboundary issues in Alberta, the Prairie Provinces Water Board, Water Management Agreement, the Mackenzie River Basin Agreement that deals with waters flowing north, the International Joint Commission that deals with waters that cross the American border are all particularly important uh, for dealing with in Alberta. So there's a website for it, and uh, you can look it up and read more there. It's early days for us. We're just getting on the ground. But, the, uh, but one of the reasons I'm here is to start the discussion uh, with the Alberta community and others who are interested. And uh, it's going to be a great adventure in Saskatchewan. When we announced it, I said, if you're a, uh, someone who studies water or water scientists, this is going to feel like the early 1960s in the space age. We've never had this much funding before. 
and we've never had such high expectations over what we might do with it, and we have to deliver. So it'll be it'll be a, a it'll be a riot. So anyway, thank you. Thanks, John, for that huge, broad overview of all the issues. And if you want to know how to access that $78 million, you might want to save that question after the meeting. Right. Uh, but let's open it up now for a comments or discussion. We have about uh, 45 minutes or so. Sure. Any questions, comments? Just give me a minute. Do you have a microphone? Apparently a microphone we can uh, arrange here. Yeah. Everyone volunteer. Maybe not on. Thank you for, you know, allowing us to have all these plans that are being uh, putting in place. Mm -hmm. But on my understanding of uh, what is happening around the world as a simple person, I'm not an academic, but a regular person in the society. But through the information that gets to us, I think that we don't see here a problem of privatization of the water, how corporations are buying the rights of the water. Uh, water is a commodity. Uh, there are no regulations about, you know, who, if the water belongs to us or is starting to belong to corporations. Talking about the mountains, corporations in my country, in Chile, my country uh, of origin, I am a proud Canadian now, they are, they are, by, they are selling glaciers in Chile at this moment to corporations. Mm -hmm. They are selling the rights of the river to build hydroelectrics. Many times those hydroelectrics are as a future commodity in order to exploit minerals around there that also are going to belong to the people, I mean to the corporations. And people is being deprived of everything, so the system is doing something, and we are having a plan, a plan not considering all the things that the economical model is planning in terms of the water. You know, in Ontario, Nestle already got the rights, he bought the rights of the water there in a small town. And the people is thinking, what are we going to do for the future? That I haven't heard anything about that in this the um, yeah these are the the talk I gave was mainly on science but these it ties into these issues uh, we work with Chilean scientists on the water from the Andes and one of the basins we studied and developed the first hydrological cycle model of was the Rio Baker in the south which had proposed a massive hydroelectric development um, the uh, shortly after we published our understanding of the hydrology in that Baker, in, that, in the Rio Baker, the power line proposal was shut down uh, for that, which would have been an incredibly long power line crossing much of Chile. So the, uh, I don't know if our study influenced that, but one hopes that improved knowledge sometimes allows for better decision making. Uh, when you go into uh, who owns water, uh, water is both a human right, it's a part of the ecosystem, an intrinsic part of the ecosystem, and it's seen as a natural resource. And uh, when you have lots of water, those ideas can be, they're not compatible, but they can be, uh, you can fudge them a little bit and muddle along. And I'd say that's how perhaps Western Europe has done it in Eastern North America, where there's lots of water for a long time. In uh, Western Canada, in places, places like Alberta adopted the uh, water rights where you'd own a license to water the first in time 
first and right. Places like Saskatchewan had that and then actually abolished it and went to a water licensing based on societal need in the 1970s and some pro different provinces have taken different approaches. And the, uh, but when you have a water uh, right that can be bought, then someone can buy it and they can, they can bottle it or they, uh, they might even want to export it. So those are, uh, and we have to balance those rights along with the rights of people who need it. And um, I guess one way to view that, I say visualize someone living in the desert and what's their right to a glass of water uh, versus someone in a very wet area and what's the value of that glass of water. Well, it's almost zero. You expect it for free if you're in a wet area, but in that desert, it's your life or death associated with it. So water is not a classic economic commodity in that sense. And the, in our proposal, we suggested that water as a human right be one of the things that we develop in Canada. And also uh, that Canada still lacks a national water policy. The last framework for that was written in 1987. And we need to renew that. And a water policy for Canada needs to address this. And also understand that the, uh, the rights and the role of water is, is very, very different. Um, if you're a fish, if you're a hydroelectric company, if you're a farmer, if you're a water bottling company, if you're uh, in a First Nation, uh, uh, completely different perspectives, and these have to be squared in some way. Generally, it's easier to do when we have lots of water, and that's perhaps why we haven't done it in Canada for a long time, but now as we're facing climate change, we have to much more carefully define these things. And we're not there yet, but that's one of the things we hope to contribute to through this study. Uh, water, water quality and, and mitigation of water quality impacts are part of the study, so it's a, it's a massive issue. Hello. Hello. Okay. okay. I am a Blackfoot. I'm a representative of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Our home is under this building. And it is an honor as a First Nation person to speak to somebody that really can maybe understand my race of people. Because we they send lots of people and we some and we don't know who really to we're bewildered on who to talk to, because we've been talking for a few hundred years about water. So um, what I want to ask you, and I, I giggled when you said that Alberta, you know, is at the head of, uh, you know, disaster, water disaster, you know, situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, a little while back, I talked to the mayor of the city and I elbowed him in the ribs and I told him, I said, uh, I'm probably the only person in this crowd that does not want to take a picture with you. But what I want to ask you is that this flood that happened, and a lot of people refer to the flood with Calgary, High River, very rarely do they mention my people. Downstream, yes. And uh, we're always left out of the conversation, especially here in Alberta, because yeah. they live in a bubble when it comes to my people. So I'm glad that you're talking and mentioning, but uh, I want to get to this point because it's very serious. I want to mm -hmm. ask, you talk about the future. What I want to talk about is the past, because a lot of the wrongs have been in the past. This province is one of the the latecomers, because they've been in the bubble about climate change. So they're catching up and they're trying to do, but what they're doing is they're neglecting the past. I come from a situation with the Old Man River Dam uh, that a Supreme Court ruling came out on that. The science of it, I think, was agreed upon on both sides, was what they said, they predicted this flood. They predicted there's going to be more floods that are connecting to climate change. Hmm. So. In talking with the mayor, I asked them, I said, because they were looking for how to mitigate, like who do we blame and how do we get the money? Do we get it from the province or do we get it from the federal government? Well, both the province and the federal government knew this flood was coming because the science told them. 
And I just wonder if part of your research, as you're finding to solutions, are you willing to go after the people and policies that, have, that are still in place that are going to create a lot of damage? And what I'm talking about is the science. They talked about the clear cutting in the watersheds. Something has to be done. Yes, they're going to build and they're going to move the water away from Calgary, but they're moving the problem somewhere else. But the real problem is, what do you do? A lot of us, we don't get to see the watersheds. But my people, we know what you've done to the watersheds. You've cut all the trees yeah, because yeah. you want to put, because in building dams, that's their, you know, their craziness of how to say they want more water. So I just want to know, is your research going to go after this? Highlight some of the, because these problems that uh, now all of a sudden these people are making themselves look good to say, oh, we're going to be, you know, we're going to do our best. But it was them that created what now we have to live in. So I just wanted to know about, because if we're going to look for the problem, we still have to look for a solution to the old problems. So I just want to know, clear cutting is a big issue. And I know a lot of people don't like to hear about it. But you need, <laughs> some of you people need to go back and see what they've done up in the watersheds. It'll scare you. So I just want to know that if there's something within your research and part of your discussions that you will address if you're going to be, like, you want to really find out how we better manage, you know, these kind of disasters. Thank it's, you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's an excellent question and a, and a very important perspective. Um, it's, uh, it's actually something that I personally study, is forest hydrology, so the impact of, of forest cover, whether it's there, whether it's been burnt, whether it's been cut, whether it's been regrowing on the water supply downstream and on the flooding downstream. And it's uh, that Marmot Creek Research Basin was actually established by the Canadian Forest Service in the early 60s they wanted to see if they could increase stream flow by clear cutting. Uh, this is the 60s, so you have, it's a different mentality back then. So they're saying, could we engineer a watershed to get more water out of the mountains? And, the, um, and so that, that was shut down, but we can look at that experience and those measurements and help us understand the impact of clear cutting on this. Um, and in fact, we, we did a computer modeling study of, of the 2013 flood and just said, well, what would have happened in Marmot Creek if every tree had been cut down and left standing, but the soil had been undisturbed? And it was interesting. There was very little impact on the flood peak, according to our calculations. And it's because the forest canopy can only hold a few millimeters of water in the canopy. But then we said, well, OK, what if during that forest removal, the forest soils were heavily disturbed? And so we would squash, squash them by heavy machinery or something so that they could only store half the water. And if you do that, you get a flood peak that's double what we had in 2013. And so I think it's helping us understand that the answer is in the soils of the forest and how those are disturbed as much as it is in the canopy. And the removal of the canopy with the disturbance of the soils had a potential to dramatically increase the damage from that flood. So that's clearly something we need to avoid. Um, the uh, and that, uh, so that's an area that we're researching and that's something we want to do with the computer models when we look at water futures. It's saying, well, not only is the climate different, but the forest cover is different for whatever reasons. And uh, what are we going to be looking at? And what, what impact will that have on our future flooding and our water supply and our droughts? And uh, so it's, um, so I guess uh, the answer from at least what we've seen is that if it's snowmelt, flow, yes, if you remove the forest canopy, stream flow uh, goes up about 25%, including the peaks. And that can be quite damaging. The flood in late June 2013 in the forest was mostly rainfall fed. And therefore, the forest canopy didn't affect the rain too much. But if you affect the soils when you're disturbing it, then it's a massive impact. And that's what we have to avoid. So we're trying to pinpoint that because people still want wood and they still want to do things in the forest, but can it be done in a way that doesn't degrade the water? And I think those solutions are there, so. Hi, John. I just wanted to express my huge gratitude to you for your work. I draw on it um, quite a lot. Um, 
But I wanted to ask you about um, the, the part of this project that's predicting water futures. I was glad to hear that the futures is in the plural. It's not just one future that's written in stone. Mm. Um, but you know, as a humanities scholar, to me what pops out is that there are all these variables in those futures that relate to our political lives. And mm -hmm. um, what would be most useful for me as an activist is to have data that reflects, you know, what does the water future look like if we leave the tar sands in the ground and shale gas in the ground? What does the, the water future look like if we switch to something like horse logging where we're sustainably interacting with the forest? Yeah. If we switch from industrial agriculture to traditional agroecological systems with water retentive soils, if we make these changes to our cities, these kinds of contingencies rather than assuming that we can continue on something very similar to our current trajectory. So I'm wondering if, if there is um, part of the research agenda reflects the potential for really radical and transformative change in our relations with the hydrosphere. Part of it in the futures we'll be looking at, uh, for instance, what happens if we don't sign any agreements on controlling carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, the worst case, and then also, you know, we do it, um, we're probably too pessimistic to do it realistically, but we say, okay, what would happen if, if the human extra emissions from humanity stopped tomorrow somehow? And uh, it's interesting, you know, the, even if the human CO2 emissions stopped tomorrow, we're committed to rapid and almost complete deglaciation in the Rockies because the glaciers have these elephant memories and there's a long-term climate signal there. We'll still have some of the large ice fields but we'll lose most of the glaciers that you can see from the valley bottoms. Um, the, uh, there are certainly examples where if water is managed very, very carefully, uh, there are human societies that can live in reasonable bounds with that and still have an intact ecosystem. But it's really hard when you have high populations, and that's the Earth has got more people now than it's ever had in its history, and that's going to always challenge anything that we do. Uh, we're almost into which bad decision do you want to make? Which least bad decision are we into? Uh, but at least we can explore those and try to um, uh, try to soften it as much as possible. I think we're in for, uh, frankly, a very difficult time over the next century with the changes to the climate and the uh, numbers of people on the planet and the requirements for food and the um, and requirements for water. And it's. Uh, you know, I just hope that in 50 years we still have a few places where people remember what an intact and ecosystem still looks like and what that water tastes like. And it's, uh, if that's going to hold out anywhere, it's going to be in Canada and probably in the west and in the north. So, um, so it, that's, we very much have our eye on that. How we answer it, I don't know yet. <laughs> it's Thank you so much, and uh, I'll say a hearty mazel tov on the uh, accomplishments of getting such a large funding proposal in and accepted. I know uh, the challenges of that and the hours and hours and hours of labor that goes into it. My question has to do with the role of the indigenous peoples in the research process. And so I noticed um, amongst the cross-Canadian elements, you uh, have up a chart which says there are seven indigenous communities, which seems to be, in my understanding, a little bit on the low side for the numbers in terms of the vast network that you're establishing. So I wanted to hear about those seven communities and perhaps why there aren't more. And the other part of the question has to do with the role of the indigenous community. So what I noticed in another one of your slides was that the indigenous communities fall into the third pillar with, and what you described is as the users. And I was just wondering about the positioning of the indigenous communities, not just as the water users, but as uh, stewards, as leaders in knowledge, and in leaders as researchers. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll address that. The seven, it's a good question. The seven that were listed there were, were groups that provided letters of support for the application to the federal government. One of them was the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations. So, it's more than one community in that sense. Our strongest links putting it together were in Saskatchewan and in the Northwest Territories. 
and so there are a large number of in, indigenous uh, governments and communities in that area and ones that we've worked with a lot in the Cumberland Delta on the Saskatchewan River in the Slave Delta area um, and, the, uh, and in northern Saskatchewan. Uh, it's not enough and the, uh, uh, there's a few from Ontario but not so many there and uh, very sparse. We have some from the Yukon, we have some from British Columbia but it's, it's sparse. And so uh, partly it was in developing that proposal we didn't have a time to sit down to consult people to, to the point where they could felt comfortable writing a letter of support at this point but those discussions have started and we need to do more of it. In terms of the word users that's it's not water users it's uh, we need to come up with a better term it's stakeholders and users of information but the the design of the study is that it's user-led and so we're starting by a, with a consultation process that will begin this fall and that started well it started a bit while we were consulting for letters of support but really take off this fall to say what are the problems what are the perspective how do you manage it how do you see it right now uh, what's the role of traditional knowledge in, in governing this and and helping to understand that and so we have uh, many of our uh, groups of researchers work really closely with uh, communities one in particular is in the slave river area in delta and uh, work very deeply with them in developing that and they mix uh, sort of the western empirical deterministic science with traditional knowledge in coming up with the results and in canada that's how we do business that's the uh, that's the model for moving forward so we'll be doing more of that and i i agree we've just started so and if i could just uh, recommend that perhaps uh, you reach also out to quebec I, you didn't mention the Quebec uh, First Nations, but I know that many of the Quebec First Nations, particularly those that uh, are further north, um, are really very, very involved in looking at these questions. And so I would mm -hmm. just invite you to consider how to involve uh, those First Nations and the research that they've been doing and the teaching and training that they've been doing, the stewardship that they've been carrying for. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, Peter Neal, World Ocean Observatory. You mentioned the, the need for national water policy. Is it possible that your research plan actually would create the research data that's comprehensive enough and, and contemporary enough so that when the political climate changes and there is support inevitably for the creation of a national ocean policy, you will have done the research and we won't have to start and do it all over again? We're hoping to inform it. Um, we can't make anyone adopt a policy. No, I understand that, yeah, but did you yeah. anticipate all of the questions that they sort of ask and answer in your planning, the questions that inevitably would be asked, and mm -hmm. the answer that, uh, that we need more research would have been already anticipated and provided? Yeah, see, um, uh, there have been discussions and continue to be discussions on uh, national water policy for Canada through the Canadian Water Resources Association, but the, uh, all these things often come back to do we have the information basis behind it and in some cases we uh, we have very poor information we, Canada has some of the largest ungaged areas in the world in terms of stream flow how can you develop a policy when we don't know how much water is flowing down the river in part of the north um, how do we develop a policy in forest fire when we don't measure soil moisture uh, these are these are big big issues and also to have credible um, ideas of, of what the future climate will bring to us in terms of available water and what the options are um, in terms of managing it. So all that has to go into it. I'm hoping, you know, it was the federal government that gave us this money through the Canada First. So this is a tremendous increase in interest uh, federally in water. Uh, that's the first sign. And so I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, they will be coming back to us in a few years and say, well, what have you know? In fact, I know they will. They're going to demand a report every year. It'll be very thick. Um, but, the, but actually sitting down with them and saying, okay, after three or four years, what do you know, what do you don't know, and, uh, and how can this help inform a policy? So I'm hoping, and we put in our proposal that they agreed upon that we wanted to see as a result at the end of seven years that we've informed a national water policy. And so we, we put a paragraph on that, and nobody complained. So... That's all I can say. Hi. So I know there's going to be a lot of assumptions in this question, so just so you know I know that. But mm -hmm. I'm curious, how, how do scientists um, 
or what I'm really hungry for is for science and scientists to really be uh, speaking from the heart for, mm. as opposed to the head. And so instead of like all facts and, and research and statistics, like what is happening in the scientific community? Um, if Is there anything happening in the scientific community where you're actually connecting from a spiritual sacred and that your work comes from there as well as from the research perspective. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's, it's something scientists struggle with because the, in particular Western science is very much facts-based and, um, and it emerged from struggles with the church in the 1600s where you had societies in Western Europe that were belief systems and if you didn't agree with that, uh, you got burnt or you got hung or whatever. Um, so anyway, so that's, so there's a there's strong empiricism going back to Galileo and others saying that uh, this is based on what we can observe and we'll set up a hypothesis and this is very cold clinical approach to it. Um, I think water scientists are a little bit different. There's a bit more passion in there uh, than, than you might get with other uh, types of sciences. Most people studying in water, uh, you say, how did you get into it? Well, they might like to fish or they simply might like to canoe a lot or things like that. And when I see students, they almost always have these characteristics where they, they seem to have a, a need to be out in the mountains on a ski uh, much of their lives. So there, there's something, there's, they already have some connection there uh, that's in there and uh, tend to be more broader, more broadly based. But the, uh, in terms of publishing the research and all of that, yes, you have to follow the scientific method. When we start to engage with society and everything, then different values come forward. And that's, uh, that's what you see driving uh, development of proposal like this. Um, you know, we don't get paid extra f out of the 143 million. That's, uh, that's just working harder. And that, that has to come from something other than the scientific method. So. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, this fo question follows neatly on the heels of the previous question. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, when I hear a presentation like yours, uh, I feel despair. Um, and uh, I guess my question to you is, I'm sure you feel despair sometimes. You've got an incredible breadth and depth of knowledge um, that is fairly dire. So mm -hmm. if you might uh, be able to comment on what it is that uh, maybe comforts you or gives you uh, great optimism. Maybe it's something, I, I'll just leave it at that. No, you no. must feel some optimism to continue to do the work that you do. I hope that you do. <laughs> yeah, I've lived a lot of my life in Saskatchewan, and the, there's something they call irrational optimism, uh, which often goes to people who live there. I think it's prairie farmers who think next year it'll get a good crop, and it won't hail, and there won't be a windstorm, and, or the Rough Riders might do better eventually. And, um, so there's, it's probably irrational, but it's there. And um, yeah, there are terrible things, and particularly when you travel around the world. You look at Nepal um, or down in uh, Central Africa and areas like that, and you see real suffering that we have no concept of in Canada. Um, but the, uh, you know, what comforts me is getting out in nature where it's still intact. And that's, uh, you know, that's when I take a break, that's what I do. And then that's, because you know, in the end, that you know, we're gonna have more people on the planet we're go everyone's going to want to be richer and do more and everything like that. So how do we preserve that uh, while we're doing everything else? And that's, uh, so that's, that's probably some of the drive in there. But, so I'm optimistic that we can save something and, uh, and maybe eventually come to our senses. But we're not there yet. I see we're into coffee time, and that's really dangerous. But I did have one pressing question or comment. And yeah. if you can please make it very short. Absolutely, sure. Thank you very much uh, first for your presentation. Uh, you. One part that was really interesting but uh, you didn't really uh, flesh out was the science communication part. So mm -hmm. I would appreciate if you could uh, say a few words about like what kind of disciplines, institutions or programs are involved in this big project that you have which would like address that specific issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you uh, for the question. Th there are a number of issues. Uh, one. Uh, one thing we do um, that we're already doing that we'll do more of is work with uh, writers and those who can engage uh, the popular imagination 
better than a scientist can. One is in the audience, Bob Sanford, who spoke this morning and is, uh, is a naturalist and has uh, trained as a scientist, but is, excels as someone who can communicate uh, scientific issues to the broad public in the right cultural context. Um, we have to go beyond that, and, and he has many books that have dealt with this. Uh, we have to go beyond that. Uh, sometimes we do it through television, uh, so encouraging documentaries, things like that. Others, it's visits to communities and spending some time, and many of our colleagues do that. The social science aspects of this, uh, it's an area of research in social science, and so the uh, uh, some of the scientists in our group work on developing decision support theaters. And uh, actually part of the proposal is a decision support room with multiple screens where lots of information can be displayed in such a way that a, a, a group or community can make a complex decision from many, many factors. But it's not always reasonable to say, well, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have to go to this building on campus to the decision support theater. That's a silly idea sometimes. And so we're looking at ways to take that to communities in a portable fashion and also through phones or whatever people want to look at these days. Um, so it's, it's changed quite a bit over time and it's rapidly changing in our society how people communicate. So we're trying to keep up with that. And I'm, I'm probably the worst at that. I, I don't do social media, I don't get it. But we know people who do, so 